Welcome to the Check It Out podcast. Today is November 20th, 2013, and we're doing a special recording in honor of the 50th anniversary of the JFK assassination. And I am here with Jeremy Shermack. Hi, Jeremy. Hello. Thanks. Thanks. For me. Thank you for coming. Jeremy uh, is a full time faculty member, teaches comm and journalism, so it's great to have you here. And um, we're getting ready on um, what's the date? November 22nd? 22nd, yes. This we'll, is Friday. Yeah, we'll mark the 50th anniversary of the death of President Kennedy, and there's all kinds of conversations in the media going on around that. Um, Jeremy and I have spoken a lot over the years about conspiracy theories and information and misinformation, so we thought this would be a good time to have a short podcast around those things and to tie this in with our one book, one college program on World War Z. One of the themes of World War Z uh, looks at the way that knowledge is spread about pandemics and outbreaks and how misinformation about health information, other information, spreads to counteract good information. And the um, assassination of John F. Kennedy has spawned many uh, conspiracy theories over the years. And so um, with that, I think we want to give a quick warning about conspiracy theories and what you're about to hear. Right. We're, not, we're not here to uh, promote the idea of conspiracy theories because something, something that tends to happen when it, when it comes to uh, conspiracy theories is that if you do hear a certain idea, it starts to click around in your head a little bit, and you start to think, "Oh, well, that's interesting. Maybe, you know, maybe maybe that's true, or maybe that, I don't know." You know, right? And, and so we're gonna we're gonna mention some of those ideas today, but I, I, I we want to make clear that we're not here to promote those ideas necessarily, because quite honestly, over the course of time that we've been discussing these, we've found them to be completely debunked, right? And you know, totally false. Um, and we believe that very strongly, but these are worth discussing because they bring up a lot of issues of how people process information uh, and you know what we look for um, when we're seeking truth. And so they're very important discussions to have in the business that um, you know that we're in. That's right. That's right. And I, I there's a a theory from social science research called seizing and freezing. And uh, if you don't know anything about a topic, the first thing that you hear on that topic will become the thing that you judge all other pieces of knowledge about. So if you know nothing about the JFK assassination, the first thing you hear, if it's a conspiracy theory, that becomes the story that everything else must try to dislodge. And that happens with all kinds of information. So um, in the library, from an information literacy standpoint, we find this very interesting as we help students um, who have all different kinds of experiences conduct research. So this is uh, something worth considering for sure. And, and if, you, if you were to go on, for instance, YouTube or you know, even just Google, um, you know, if you, if you were to Google JFK or if you were to Google, you know, or, or YouTube 9-11, you, tend, you don't get a news report first when, in your results, you know. You will get a conspiracy video or, you, will, you know, <laughs> right. that, that tends to be the most prominent results on those websites. So if that's the first thing you see in your first knowledge of these events, anything in the future is going to be hard to, to really, you know, pull you away from those ideas. Right. That's right. Okay, could you just give us maybe a quick background? And neither of us are historians, but I know there's probably people listening, many people, including us, who weren't alive during, mm-hmm. in 1963. Mm-hmm. Um, so maybe a quick overview of what happened with the assassination and then kind of the, since then, the, some of the conspiracies. Sure. Uh, John F. Kennedy uh, was president and uh, at that time, obviously, and he was in uh, Dallas, Texas, uh, and was going to a few fundraisers. And at that time, uh, presidents didn't travel that often as they do today. You know, we see Air Force One, it seems like, every week going somewhere. <laughs> right. Uh, but that, it wasn't all that common. So when he went to Dallas, it was this huge deal. Big deal. Really big deal. I mean, there, we're talking about a parade through the streets. You know, more on that later, uh, quite obviously. But he was there to do fundraising. And uh, on the morning of the 22nd, he had a, a breakfast uh, that they held uh, in Dallas. And that proved to be his final public speaking appearance. And then he uh, entered a motorcade, uh, and he was along with um, Governor Connolly uh, from Texas and his wife, and also John F. Kennedy's famous wife, uh, Jacqueline Kennedy. And uh, they were traveling along the streets of Dallas and going through a parade, and there was a huge celebration. In a convertible. In a convertible, right. right? Which doesn't happen anymore. Nope. (laughs) That was the last of the presidents in the convertible. Yeah. Uh, And uh, he was heading through Dealey Plaza, and uh, you may have heard of a grassy knoll referenced in, in culture, and that was, you know, the grassy knoll was right 
near um, the, the automobile and near the uh, Dealey Plaza. Um, he was shot uh, in the head. There was three shots fired. The first one missed. The second one struck him in the throat and then went through his body and actually shot uh, Texas Governor Connolly. And then the third one was the one that ultimately killed Kennedy, which was, uh, you know, he got shot in the head. Uh, and he was shot by uh, Lee Harvey Oswald, uh, who was a actually a, a far leftist. Um, he worked in some... He had, uh, he had traveled to the Soviet Union and had some uh, mixing with the communists. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, they actually they caught him, and just, I think, maybe 48 hours later, uh, Lee Harvey Oswald was killed by Jack Ruby uh, when he was being transported uh, between uh, jail cells there in Dallas. So, uh, you know, as far as significance goes, it was, it was not the first assassination of a president in U.S. history. That's right. You know, we, uh, most of us have heard about Abe Lincoln and yep. um, I think Andrew Jackson as well, maybe. No, not, oh man, we should have done our we history. Were, I know. We said we were historians and now <laughs> I'm trying later to on, this. Yeah, no, later on, um, uh, Garfield uh, perhaps? No, oh Garfield. man, email us when you get yes, the answer. Get, <laughs> I'm glad I put us on the spot. Uh, some other dude. Uh, but but it was not the first one. But what makes it so significant? It was, you know, the first of this generation, as far as the world really seeing it. Um, we watched this story develop live before our very eyes. And I say we. I mean, you know, Americans, really worldwide, everyone. Uh, you know, we we obviously hadn't had radio or television uh, in the days of those prior assassinations. So when this happened, it was very gripping because. You know, we went into four straight days of nonstop coverage of the event. Uh, you know, all regular programming was preempted. Uh, it, it took over our world. It was a very sad event because JFK was one of the more uh, well-liked presidents in recent history uh, <clears throat> on both sides of the aisle, really. Right. It was this coming together where when it happened, it became... Um, personal for everybody. Mm -hmm. and I know like my parents, my grandparents, people who lived through it, they can tell you exactly where they were when they when they heard the news. My yeah. dad, I remember telling me, you know, he was in a study hall or something and a teacher came in and said someone shot Kennedy and that was it for the day I and mean, that was the focus and that was a different kind of news experience than would have happened even 40 years earlier, right? That, that With TV in the home. Yeah. Um, and I just did a quick um, look up. There's many... Uh, assassination attempts, but um, including on many presidents, but I just did a, there's four sitting presidents who um, have been killed, and they are Abraham Lincoln, uh, Garfield, McKinley, and Kennedy. Okay. So, so those are four. My source on that is Wikipedia, so take that yes. with a grain of salt, right. but I did a quick search. Right, quick search. And, you know, uh, going back to the idea of, of how this was different from those prior. Like we said, the technology was there, and this really became a communal event um, right. for the country. We, we gathered around our television sets, and it suddenly became very unifying, and, the, and what unified us was the TV. So we were able to get information and see more than we ever had before. Right. So talk about, um, real quickly, I want to watch our time, um, how the conspiracy evolved perhaps in some of the different theories and there, there, I can see even with the the, the setting is set, is there where yes. all of a sudden um, Oswald is assassinated all, Oswald had associations with the communists like there's all these things that just automatically and then this is the warning to all of you we don't support these conspiracies in fact we we know they're not true but when we say them you're going to wonder, and they will carry with you. They're like a ghost that sits on your shoulder. So, yeah. so give us those ghosts, if you would. And, and to give you an idea of the strength of this ghost, I guess, if, if, if that's what we'll call it, uh, I was watching uh, CBS News ran a uh, 50th anniversary, and you're going to see a ton of these coming out over the course of the next week or so. Uh, very good ones, actually. But uh, they, they did a poll. This is today. Uh, that 61% of Americans still believe that Oswald did not act alone. Right now, that they're not saying there was a conspiracy, but they sort of are. No one's yep. really committing exactly to. So that just gives you an idea of the power and the uh, you know the, the staying power really of these types of uh, thoughts. Uh, but immediately, and, and this happens with a lot of events. It happened with nine eleven. We want to simplify things when when we see something that is truly so unbelievable. Uh, and, and so jarring, like a, an assassination of a president or a horrible terrorist attack, 
we really want to try to simplify things. That's, that's just almost a, a reaction of our minds. Right. So immediately after JFK was assassinated, you know, we went to the Soviets and we thought, okay, well, this was a, you know, this was the, the communist regime. You know, they wanted to take out Kennedy. Uh, along the lines of, of the communists, Cuba was was named. Um, mm-hmm. Fidel Castro was believed to be involved. Right. Uh, another another uh, part that it isn't discussed that often was um, Dallas was actually politically very uh, volatile at that time. A lot of folks said Kennedy should not make that trip. Right. They were uh, a hotbed of uh, extreme right wing. Right. Um, a long-time Democratic state, old yeah. Democrats back from the Civil War, yep. on their way to becoming a Republican state, which they are today. Right, and there was this extreme right wing, uh, and they actually took out ads in the, in the Dallas Morning News, you know, these kind of scathing, uh, full-page ads questioning the president. I mean, you know, the reporters will even say that they were embarrassed that those those ads were in the paper. Right. Uh, so it, w- it was a hostile environment, so there was a belief that someone from that side had done this. So we certainly had suspects, and we wanted to know right away who did this, you know, immediately, because that it made us feel safer. We'll, we would know, well, is there going to be other shootings? Are there other people that are going to come out? Is this, is, is this part of a bigger plot? So on and so forth. Right. So there's some comfort that we seek, and that can lead to us trying to come, or us actually coming up with conspiracy theories. Yeah, absolutely. So um, let's try to break down the conspiracy theory like why and you hit this a little bit about the simplicity like so why why do they hang on why are they attractive why are they so, um, strong arguments mm-hmm. uh, maybe talk a little bit more about the simplicity and wh- how, why we want to understand the world yeah. it, it, it's these end up being so tremendously complicated in some ways because of everything that leads up to uh, the event you know I think I think really 9/11 is probably maybe more complicated as far as, you know, the, the amount of time it took, you know, if you have Bin Laden involved, I mean, his involvement, his kind of uh, creation almost as this, this enemy number one happened in the 80s, really, and it built up over time. Right. Uh, but, you know, we want to, we really want to have a black and white. That that helps our mind. That helps us get our mind around it. It's, it's hard to process something that is so monumental, like I said earlier, uh, and, you know, we want to have the good guy, bad guy. We really right. do. And we want to know, you know, who is this bad guy? How do we get them? How do we protect ourselves from them? And if there isn't, if the information doesn't exist there, we are willing to fill in the gaps in order to create that sort of comfort zone. Right. And that yeah, leads to I can these see conspiracy that. theories. And I, and I think part of that um, is that good and bad kind of world. Like, we want to know who the good guys are. We want to know who the bad guys are. And that... Could this possibly have just been done by... It's almost like we can't handle randomness. Like, right. could a guy in a cave plan an attack that brings down the World Trade Center? No way, but yes way. And yeah. could a random individual who was a good, a crack marksman right. kill the U.S. president? And we'd rather think there was... It feels better to think that there's these good forces and bad forces and not this randomness. Mm-hmm. And so there must be some plot behind it. Yeah. And I think you get into the problem where you have a negative... And you can't. There's no evidence to disprove the negative. It's, it's. There's. If if you act alone, you don't have a, a trail. And, and it's interesting that when you have assassins um, live. So like you know Reagan, there was an assassination attempt where he was shot in the 80s mm-hmm. as as president. He Reagan lived, and um, the uh, assassin lived. Mm-hmm. No conspiracy. He's just a crazy guy. When he lives and you can talk to him, you find out that there isn't some. But if, if the assassin was was killed, right. then it becomes this whole other story that builds around it. And right? again, that's filling in the gaps. We, Lee Harvey was killed the next day, you know, right. and, you know, with the 9-11 situation, they were suicide attackers, so they weren't around to be questioned. Right. Uh, so, you know, we again, we had to fill those gaps. And if you look at, for instance, for you know, an example with the, with the JFK situation, a lot of conspiracy theorists jump to uh, certain really coincidences that occurred that day. Uh, for instance, in the motorcade, we mentioned earlier he was in a convertible. Um, there was that kind of protective bubble uh, that could be placed over that convertible, sort of like you see with the Pope Mobile these days, <laughs> right? Right. And uh, Kennedy chose not to have that that day. It was it was a rather crisp fall day, in uh, a beautiful day, in. Uh, in Dallas, and he said, "Hey, you know, let's go out in the open air. It's nice." Didn't didn't want the bubble on, and it was his choice. Exactly, it was his choice. But yeah. conspiracy theorists said, "Well, 
you know, someone involved at the Secret Service must have insisted that they left that bubble right. off so this could happen. They fill in the blanks. They fill in yeah. the blanks. Yeah, I think so. So let's um, think of, I'd like to ask, you know, why are these, in this time in history, why now? Why do these conspiracy theories live on, it seems like at least, in ways that they haven't in the past? Mm -hmm. Why are we kind of ripe for this knowledge, and why do we fall for it? We are, we have more information uh, at our fingertips um, than ever before and you know quite obviously that that comes along with the advent of the internet uh, and how important that has become as a, a distribution center if you will for information I mean that, that's quite obvious to anyone uh, and there's no gatekeeper there right anyone could put up a website about JFK conspiracies anyone can make a YouTube about a 9-11 conspiracy uh, there is no editor there you don't see those things generally from the New York Times or you know Wall Street right. Journal or whatever have you. Uh, so, and, and folks who again going back to this idea of the, the seizing and freezing, where if if you if that's the first thing you see, you know you grab onto that. So if you if you go and log on to YouTube and search for JFK, you see that video, and it's just made by some guy in his basement in Minnesota. Right. You know you might you might grab onto that and. Uh, you know, that, that's a good thing and a bad thing, right? That right. we have that information access. We just have to be very careful with our information and what we, what we take to heart and what we put in our minds and be good processors. We have to make yeah. sure. Yeah, and I think the fact of being removed from the evidence is interesting. I think there was a time where we had this belief in science, and, and I'm, I really am thinking maybe 80 or 90 years ago, when people could remember a time before the scientific revolution really had impact on us, when we didn't have like electricity, you didn't have refrigerators, you didn't have TV. And so as science improved our lives, we could see the results of that. Mm. Um, and so there was this belief in scientists and to some degree a belief in authority that I think now as we take these things for granted and are less connected from the previous world, um, and there's not, scientists aren't always perfect. I mean, I admit that, and scientists make mistakes. So I think there's part of that too. We recognize those mistakes, and we're, we're, there's a time where we just took science at its face. And I think we've moved beyond that a little mm -hmm. bit, and we we don't give away that authority for good and for bad. Exactly. Yeah. And, and again, becoming you know something I emphasize in my journalism classes uh, is being a better media consumer. You know, understanding where it comes from why it's produced, yep. the purpose, how, it's made. how yeah. it's made, exactly. So, you know, even if the students don't come out of that class being journalists, I always say at the very least, and I think something that's important for everyone, is to be a good media consumer, question things. That's okay. Right. Right. It's okay to do that. Yeah. Uh, there, is, there is bad media out there. There's right. bad information out there. Question, but, but at some point you have to make decisions. Yes. I mean, one of the problems why I think why these things carry on is we just keep the skepticism alive. Mm -hmm. um, I think there's also something larger going on that you and I have talked about in society, this like distrust of the big organization. Right. The, 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 the most power, powerful bodies that we have in our society, which you, know, you typically hear of as quote unquote big, uh, you know, big government yep. or uh, big, know, corporation. big corporation, you know, corporate America, those sort of things that we view as massive and, uh, you know, something that we have we cannot defeat or that we cannot uh, trust and we think that is sort of the machine right you know that that's that's pushing forward this information uh, and you know I, I know a lot of people where you know if we ask them why are these Google searches why are these, these particular items showing up at the top of the list and everyone says they paid them they paid them, they paid you know? right but that's that's not true right, right? Like except for the ads but the, you know the, the reason why is because of the number of links and so on and so forth really pretty good reasons uh, that that demonstrate that it's strong information, but right. people still believe it's because they paid Google. Yeah. Right. Or you take like the um, the there's the vaccine debates, which are, are kind of silly, and I think they put a lot of us at risk. Um, the the bottom line is that obviously big pharma is paying for all this research, and no scientists can be trusted. Mm -hmm. And then we know the truth, and that you know I even had friends of mine tell me that my library must get money from big pharma if we you know think that vaccines are safe, mm -hmm. which is just ridiculous. I wish we got more yeah. money. We got money from them. Right? Right. Like, we yeah. don't. <laughs> like, yeah. It's just, I have no incentive. Right. But just that there's science and that there's, if you know scientists and you see scientists work, they are not all under the influence of this big money somehow. Mm -hmm. But I think we, again, that divide the world into these forces yeah. and we don't like the randomness 
that these stories tend to feel good to us even if they're not necessarily true. It's almost like this tribal instinct within us that we want there to be sides so we can pick a side yeah. to move on. Yeah. And you think about the randomness of your everyday life. You know, you run into the guy you went to high school with. You know, you, you see the person that you have your 8 o'clock class at, you know, at the Starbucks or whatever. These, all these events happened on a day where there, were, you know, there was coincidence. Right. I mean, I know they're monumental events, but there was coincidence with those two. Anything that we do right. has a certain element of randomness to it. Even these huge acts that are, in a lot of cases, especially if you look at something like 9-11, very well planned, very, you know, just very precise, randomness occurs. Yeah. It just yeah. does. Um, and, and I think there's also a factor around how educated our society is, which is different from the from 100 years ago, 200 years ago, and I think that plays into it. Yeah. I mean, you look at literacy rates, I mean, for, you know, for instance, I mean, in certain areas of the country, they're not as great as they should be, right? We, right. We'd hope them to be, but we are, we are more literate. We're certainly more media literate, more digitally literate right. as far as the internet goes. Um, you know, more folks are going to college these days than ever before. Right. Uh, we, are, we just are a generally more educated society. Which is generally good, <laughs> which it's is a great thing. Right. I, it, it obviously, is. we believe in that as educators. Sure. But I think along with that comes this idea where, which again is generally good, mm -hmm. that we are going to make our own decision. And there's also this kind of mentality where I want to show that I'm smarter than the rest because I believe, like, I know the truth. Here's, I saw this conspiracy video, and it's to show, and I know the truth, and you don't, you know, like that's. I think there's something about that where you want to show your independence. That maybe this isn't true for everybody, but it's definitely a factor. It's almost like the the hipster factor. Yeah. I think you, there's kind of like hipster intelligence, you know, <laughs> right. where it's like, well, I heard this from this blog, and you know, if it's popular, it must be wrong. Right. Yeah. And if and if you read it in the Tribune, if you read it in the New York Times, well, that's you know they have they're all you know, part of the system. Corporate America is part. You know, they're part of this machine, and and corporate America has them in their back pocket, so on and so forth. Uh, you know, when you really go behind the scenes, you know, at, at some of those newspapers, they're still doing the the best, most thorough reporting that's been done so from from a journalistic standpoint. And certainly, you have your case of you know, like Judith Miller, and you know, uh, uh, some of the other problems that we've seen in journalism in recent years. But they're still doing the best hard reporting. Uh, and it's not to say those sources are perfect, but yeah. It, but even like the Judith Millers, it's hard for the people involved to keep it a secret exactly that's especially over out. time yeah, that's, yeah. That, that's gonna come out eventually because we can be inquisitive and we can find alternate sources so right. really what it comes back to is a responsibility that we have as individuals to look at the information that we're consuming and analyze it you know we used to just you know it used to just be like a, a big dinner and we'd sit down and Walter Cronkite would be at one end of the table and he'd say here's the news and we'd say great and we'd consume it and we'd leave but now you know we can there's other conversations occurring in the and we can think about what people are saying over in this corner, what they're saying on that side of the table. And then individually we can say, okay, what do I believe? What do I buy into? What do I want to explore more on my own? Right. In, within reason, right? Because we yep. can't all do that. But, uh, you know, we, we, have, we have power as far as information goes and right. our access. And we also now have, we're all now in a position to make decisions and decide what is quote-unquote truth yeah. you know not to open a pandora's box there but sure it, 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 well and I, and I think connecting to that is the the idea should be with us that we live in a complex world yes. and you know when you're studying science or you're studying history or you're studying government that there's a lot of complexity and that education and knowing things by what they do simplifies things like that's how we get our ideas we make some simpler ideas mm -hmm. but underlying all these simple ideas are a lot of complexity that a lot of people are studying. And so when anyone walks up to you with an overly simplified explanation of any story, you should be skeptical of that mm -hmm. because underneath is probably a whole lot messier. Right. And part of the problem of disproving some of the, the vaccine myths out there is that when you put up one thing, they do make some simplistic arguments about vaccines, and the reality is it's more complicated. And then the opponents dive into that complexity, yeah. even though the larger picture is it's better off for all of us to use vaccines and that they're safe. Yeah. And the same with JFK is that there wasn't a conspiracy. Right. And the, Lee Harvey Oswald acted alone. The, the, the simple answer was that a 29-year-old, rather extreme, you know, kind of mundane guy yeah. 
who was had some probably mental instability. It yeah, seems some some, is, <laughs> some issues. <laughs> right. You know, wearing a, a white undershirt, working at the Texas Book Depository, got a rifle, opened up the window, and shot the president. Right. Shot the the leader of the free world. And we just that doesn't register with us, and that's totally understandable. That's right. just the human mind, but it was that simple. So, you know, when we think about explanation, you know, is is it simple? Sometimes it is. Most of the time, it's very complicated, but you still have to be willing to accept that simple answer. Right. You know, that, yeah, that just happens sometimes. Yeah. Um, okay. Well, I want to thank you for your time. Thank you. Um, I get nervous talking about conspiracy theories sometimes because we're you help keep them alive, but I think that's the only way that we really can counteract the misinformation out there yeah. is to talk about it. So. Again, the key is responsibility. Just, just you know, it's okay to question, but really think about, I have to come to some sort of conclusion on my own, question, and then make a determination. So. Great. Okay, thank you, and I want to thank all of you for listening.